Yes, summer ends and we get back to business as usual. Many of us are thinking about kickstarting our health and fitness. So for inspiration, I want you guys to check out this guy. He is 61 years old and no clearly way. Jack 61. And I got to tell you, he's a really good friend of mine, and he's out with a new book about how we can all be in the best shape of our lives at any age while still eating a little bit of ice cream. Let's check in with Strauss Zelnick. He's the chairman and CEO of Take-Two Interactive Software. Hear more about the quarter and where his company's headed. Mr. Zelnick, welcome back to Man Money. Good to see you, Strauss. Nice to see you, Jeff. Please have a seat. Thanks for having me. If we can build multiple James Bonds of the interactive entertainment business, that's what we would like to do for Red Dead Redemption 2 offers incredible opportunity, and I think the expression of that opportunity is gonna blow us all away. Strauss, uh, congratulations on the deal, first of all. Thank you very much, nice to be here. Hi everyone, and welcome to The Conversation with Max Carter. This episode um, is a big deal for me personally because my, day, my guest today is frankly someone I look up to and aspire to be in many ways. All of us have that cool person we like and would want as our mentor, and Strauss Zelnick is that person to me. Uh, those who watch the show or know me personally uh, know that I'm not a big fan of titles, but Strauss's career and personal pursuits such as fitness speaks for, speak for themselves. Strauss is the CEO of Take-Two Interactive, the company that is behind the game such as the Grand Theft Auto series, Red Dead Redemption, 2K, and many, and I mean many more. He's managing his private equity firm, ZMC. He was the CEO of 20th Century Fox, a chairman of CBS, and boy, much more than that. I'm excited to have this conversation with you today, Strauss, and welcome to the show. Thank you very much, nice to be here. I think we'll kick it off with a simple question. You have been involved in many areas of the entertainment industry, music, film, gaming, you name it. So I bet you met a lot of interesting people along the way. I'm curious, what was your most memorable celebrity encounter? Well, I, 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 I've met many celebrities in all parts of the entertainment business. And um, I'm not sure I have a, a particular, particularly memorable celebrity encounter that would be much more than um, glorified name dropping. Um, so, not no one particular encounter comes to mind um, with regard to anyone that you would probably have heard of. Uh, however, I was um, I was reading a book um, I like to read, and I was reading a physics book a couple of years ago called *The Elegant Universe* by Brian Greene, and um, it's an extraordinary book, and it's it's challenging if you're not um, a physics student, and I wasn't. Um, but it's still, it, was, it was still sort of understandable, or at least most of it was. It's also beautifully written. And, um, and uh, so I was really engaged with the book and I ha was having lunch with a friend and he asked just in passing, what, what are you reading? And I said, I'm reading The Elegant Universe by Brian Greene. And he said, oh, Brian Greene's a friend of mine. Would you like to meet him? And I said, definitely. And I met Brian Greene and um, I've spent a lot of time with him. He's an extraordinary person. And uh, my encounters with him have been truly memorable because he's brilliant and he heads theoretical physics at Columbia University in New York. And I don't get to run into people like that very often. So that's the one that comes to mind. Yeah, I'm familiar with Brian Green. Actually, I think I've seen his uh, TED talk and he, he's quite a brain. I love it. And yeah, he's, he's really, really wonderful and a great guy. <laughs> I love it. It's a combination, good combination. Um, take two is a parent of a legendary franchise, Grand Theft Auto, among other big, big names. So when it comes to the development of any large game of that kind, how does the business side of things work alongside the creative processes that are such a huge part of the overall success? How do you control it from the management perspective? Well, I, I think we start by being completely aligned in our interests. The goal of our company is to be the most creative, the most innovative, and the most efficient entertainment company in the world. and that's our goal at the corporate level and that's our goal at our, our labels uh, uh, as well. And so Rockstar Games, which creates Grand Theft Auto and Grand Theft Auto Online and many other huge titles, is, is focused on those very things. And our economic interests are aligned and our personal interests in creating the best entertainment on earth, uh, those are aligned as well. So we don't have to control the business side of the equation because our our culture and our mission are so widely adopted across the enterprise. How would you describe your culture? 
Uh, the culture is one of ambition and performance, a focus on excellence, and at the same time, one of kindness, uh, mutual respect, inclusion, um, and uh, common understanding. And you've made several career changes. You moved from 20th Century Fox to Crystal Dynamics, and then you joined BMG before um, ultimately becoming the CEO of Take-Two. Um, what were the circumstances that made you do these changes? And how do we know it's the right time for us to move on in our career? I believe uh, that it's a good idea to start by knowing what you want. I think that success is highly correlated with knowing how you define success and then and knowing what it means to you. Alan's view of success, my view of success may not be yours, Max, probably, probably wouldn't be yours. And um, many people, particularly talented and educated people, uh, who are inundated with offers and opportunities don't stop to think about what life can look like 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. I was pretty good about doing that. So when I was in my 20s, I was able to think about what life might look like in my 30s and 40s. And when I was in my 40s, I was able to think about what life might look like in my 50s and 60s. Um, and I was able to plan accordingly, which doesn't mean that everything worked out in accordance with that plan, but it did mean that I could make decisions that were in service of my long-term goals. So initially my goals getting out of school were to run a movie studio. And I was very fortunate. I was running my first studio when I was in my late twenties and a major studio when I was in my very early thirties. Um, but having, having then achieved that goal, uh, I, I then sort of established a new set of goals, which was to run a diversified media enterprise. And I thought if I'm going to do that, I need experience, in other parts of the media business. Um, Stanley, you probably want to mute your, your device. And, um, and, um, and that led me to go to the video game business and the music business and um, other, other forms of media and entertainment. Uh, and then as I was um, sort of mid career at BMG, I thought, okay, this is another crossroads uh, moment in my career. I could, keep running businesses for other people, or perhaps I could build my own company. And if I were going to build my own company, what would that look like? And ultimately I decided there was a great opportunity to build a business that would be entirely informed and driven by digital technology. And in the, in fact, in the sort of crossroads of digital technology and media and entertainment, and that's what ZMC was intended to be. And that's why I decided to start that business um, in 2001. That's the year I was born. It's great that you mentioned ZMC because I heard that you started it with $300,000 of your own money. Can you just tell me a bit more about the growth of that venture? Um, the goal was to build a multi-billion dollar collection of media and entertainment assets that would be uh, supercharged by digital technology. And the, the money that I put up was really used just to, to have offices and computers and desks and to have a very limited payroll for a short amount of time until we bought our first company. It took us about nine months to buy our first company, which was a Japanese record company called Columbia Music Entertainment, which was a turnaround and a very difficult deal. Uh, from there, we bought a, a catalog merchant and online merchant called, well, in the early days of online merchandise called Lily and Vernon. We bought a direct marketing business from uh, Time Warner at the time. Um, that's now Warner Brothers Discovery. Uh, that business was called Time Life. Uh, and then we bought a direct marketing, uh, sorry, a market research business uh, called OTX, which was an online market research, which was a nascent field at that time. Uh, and we, we built the company from there. Um, so it was really hard, uh, you know, and it's always tempting to look back on days like that and think, wow, they were glamorous early days when you, you know, you were struggling and um, it was really cool because anything was possible and then you had immediate success. And, in the moment, it's really not like that. In the moment, it's scary when you're not sure you're going to be able to make payroll and you're not sure you're going to ever make another deal. And when you figure that it's quite possible this could fail and you disappoint a lot of people who bet on you um, or perhaps lose money for people who invested in you. So it was really hard. Uh, however, ultimately, we were able to raise capital and buy more companies. We took over Take Two in 2007, uh, we raised our first CMC fund in 2008. And today, the uh, aggregate assets managed by ZMC, including Take Two, are in you know the high 25, 26 billion dollar range. We have about 
16,000 people all around the world, about 120 offices, and we touch many areas of the media, uh, digital technology, and entertainment business. Wow. How were you picking these companies? What was your strategy back then? We always pursued themes that we thought were interesting. One theme that we thought was interesting was interactive entertainment because we knew it was a growth business. Uh, and other areas of media technology, telecommunications and software that we think were well positioned to be, um, to be growth businesses, not just in the next quarter or two, but over the course of many years. And, and given the recent, recent acquisition of Zynga, how does it change your portfolio considering the emphasis on mobile? Well, mobile now represents almost half of Take-Two's net bookings, and uh, we hope will continue to grow rapidly. Um, and prior to that, mobile games represented about 13% of Take-Two's net bookings. So we were underexposed before to the fastest part, the fastest growing part of the interactive entertainment business. And of course, the interactive entertainment business itself is the fastest growing part of the entertainment business. Are you still working with some of your mentors? I am. Uh, I guess I have, uh, I have a, a, at least four, but uh, Michael Dornemann, who's the, the lead independent director of Take-Two, he was my boss at BMG, and he's on the board here at Take-Two, and he remains a key mentor, and someone from whom I've learned and continue to learn a lot. Uh, Dick Parsons, who was the chief executive of Time Warner, uh, remains a, a, a a very important mentor. Barry Diller, who was my boss when I was at Fox long ago, is still a mentor. And uh, Don Gogel, who is the chairman and um, previously longtime CEO of a leading private equity firm called Clayton Dubolier and Rice. And I'm in touch with all of them. During your time on the board of CBS, can you just tell me a bit more about how does that job look like? Well, it wasn't a job. I was I was the non-executive chairman of the company, uh, and uh, uh, that was by by no means a, a standard job. It was a board position, and uh, it, it was very interesting. Uh, the company had come through an array of challenges and had a new board and uh, new leadership, and uh, the focus of the board at that time was um, addressing the culture of the company, and making sure it was positive. Uh, and a productive culture for the mission of the business, uh, determining the right strategic path forward and putting in place strong leadership. And I was there for a little less than two years and we were able to achieve all three of those goals during that time. Do you consider your current um, role as a CEO of Take Two Interactive a job? Sure. Yeah, there's because there is a saying that if you do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. They call it work for a reason. I really like what I do, but it's still work. What kind of advice do you have for people like me or my peers in their early 20s, hoping to create something meaningful out of their career and life? The, the thing most highly correlated with being successful is knowing what you want in the first place. So try to arrive at a set of goals that are achievable, but reasonable. And, and that are in the context of what you're doing. So if you, you know, if your goal is, I don't know, I want to be an astronaut, you're you didn't get a degree in physics and you, you don't work in a space program, you're probably not going to be an astronaut. Um, so make sure the goal is reasonable but ambitious. And then write it down in your device and, and look at it regularly and make sure that you're taking steps that are in service of achieving that goal over time. Uh, you know, when I was um, roughly your age, I, I was in business school and law school and CEOs would come talk to us a lot, and I would always ask them questions at the end of their their talks. And the question I would typically ask is the one you just asked, which is, you know, what advice would you have for someone like me? And inevitably, the advice I received fell into three categories, and they were first, listen, you know, we're taught in school to talk and to speak well and to write well, and to communicate and to be active and engaged and impressive. Um, we're probably not taught as well to listen uh, with empathy and care. And if you truly listen, you might be amazed as to what you learn. Also, if you're in a, a, a setting that's new to you, um, nothing like listening to figure out the lay of the land and, and therefore um, find a way to be productive and successful in that environment. Uh, the second is work hard. There's no substitute for hard work. When you get out of school, 
not much will distinguish you from the other people who are sitting next to you at the office um, or the workplace that you're in, uh, because none of you has any experience or track record or history. <clears throat> so, you know, what's going to distinguish you? And the answer is, and I'm going to assume you're all pretty smart, pretty educated. So what will distinguish you is hard work. And there's no substitute for that. So the advice I got was get in 15 minutes earlier than your boss, leave 15 minutes later when, you know, when people are asked uh, who wants to help out here, be the first one to raise your hand, keep a smile on your face, be diligent, you know, and deliver. And the third is never compromise your integrity because ultimately it's the only thing you have. And um, that, that, can prove challenging because you'll be encouraged at times to compromise your integrity in service of your own goals. And we're human; we can we can um, be subject to to those tugs. Uh, but try to resist them because your reputation is built day by day over a very long period of time. I appreciate it, Charles. Anytime. Great to meet you.